Hi there, Marcus here. I um, want to talk to you about um, the reading from Burke and, and about yeah, the Middle East. Also, I want to talk to you about some of the things I'd like you to do for this week, week seven. It's the middle of the semester, and I'm already astonished at that fact. I'm really delighted to be coming back onto campus as of this week as well. We'll see how I go. Um, I am very much on the mend, but not completely uh, on my feet, one might say. Um, I look a bit rough and ready, don't I? Looking at myself in the screen here. I'm going to go to share screen so I don't have to <laughs> look at myself so much. Uh, here we go. So let's let's rip into this um, quick look at where we're going this week the kind of things that I want to do. The, the, this short snapshot actually falls into two parts. The first part is me talking about deep time and the kind of thinking that I'd like to do with you, a reflecting I'd like to do with you in the seminar, number two, and also of his course to unpack some of what Burke is saying. Uh, this time I've been rather linear, uh, figuring that uh, you've got enough under your belt now in terms of the earlier readings. And uh, Burke is a, you know, a, a meat and potatoes historian, one might say. He, he's doing his historian's work. He's got a lot of um, detail in, his, uh, in this reading. Um, and it gives us a sense of how we go about taking the big ideas, let's say David Christian's three uh, key ideas of energy, complexity and collective learning, and we test them out in the historical literature and historical research. We have an image here of uh, Chinese uh, merchants on the Silk Road. Um, I decided to start with that because as Burke says early on in, in his um, chapter, that the, what he's looking at actually is not the area of the Middle East as traditionally understood, but it's the area of the, that arid area of early civilization that goes all the way from the Chinese steppes like here, right across to Morocco. So that's uh, that's why I chose this particular image. And of course, the Silk Road is, um, I think, a wonderful example. McNeil, McNeil used it, you know, as well, uh, of the human web and the way trade ties uh, communities together and spread ideas and and so on. So let's keep moving. So first point: this is preparing for uh, our reflections in the seminar this week times all around us okay uh, i want you to uh, remember that we are all temporal beings we are stardust we are organic we are historical and we are imaginative amongst many other things um you, you might say oh, i'm cranky well you might be cranky today but yesterday you might have been very happy uh, and and so on so uh we can say many things, but these are within the context of our course, temporality, us being stardust, in other words, us being connected to the very beginning of this cosmic adventure, uh, us becoming organic beings with life, have, becoming historical or cultural beings, and the imaginative uh, qualities that go along with that. I put in, uh, because I, I'm quite fascinated by exoplanets, I put in the exoplanet Kepler, and that there is, is linked as well so that you can go and read about it but scientists have found an exoplanet that's a planet outside our solar system that is roughly the same size um, as earth but obviously it looks quite different you can see here that earth's got that blue color which obviously indicates a certain kind of life um, and whereas this planet looks like uh, venus or somewhere like that um, or, or Mars, much less um, friendly to the kind of organic life that we actually experience. I found not long after posting the um, the lecture for week six, I found my English version of that um, map of our, of generations past, giving us again that quantitative sense of where do we sit in deep time well generationally if we go back 12 generations we have 4096 ancestors which is an extraordinary uh, insight for me it means that 400 years ago there were 4000 people 
on the planet, living lives, wondering, hoping, you know, struggling, as probably most of them were doing. 4,000 people who had to come together, find, you know, uh, either a mate or a love or, you know, could there, you know, no doubt there were horrible rapists and people like that as well amongst it all, to lead down to me. And, of course, if we go 400 years in the future, it means that um, there will be 4,000 people alive who will look back to me not knowing that I even existed. Probably not, not it, often people don't look back at all, do we? How often do you look back and think, wow, just going back, you know, 100 years to our great-grandparents, there were 16 people who had to find one another, pair up, and even if it was pairing up for just one night of um, fun or horror, depending on how it goes, uh, and in order for us to be on the planet. To me, that's extraordinary. It's one dimension of deep time. It's deep time within my own personal biography, but there are other forms of deep time. Just get back to the earth here. Look, there's the earth. Now we jump forward. The earth, you know, it was started forming about 4.543 billion years ago, which is a long time. You can see that there's a link here. Uh, you can see it there. I'll just move my thing. If if you click on that, you will get a two, two and a half minute little Nathan Geographic thing. It ends with Will Smith, believe it or not. I was quite surprised. Um, a National Geographic description of that very early time. Will Smith says, and water was on its way at the end there. I just remember that. Why? Because there wasn't much water at all on planet Earth in those very early stages. We needed to collect water from the, uh, the cosmos uh, in the form of comets bombarding the Earth. Mo many of those comets were heavily iced, and mo most of the water that's on our planet actually comes from extraterrestrial uh, origins or sources, which I think is also very interesting. But I'm not going to give you a, le a lesson on the early period of uh, Earth's um, emergence. Uh, you'll have to go and study geology and cosmology for that. So here we are. What One of the ways of approaching this understanding of time is to listen to this 17-minute podcast uh, the, the Well of Deep Time, it's alive here. You'll also find it on uh, the Canvas web uh, pages for History 140 under the modules, under Module 7. There's a bunch of other things there on Module 7 as well, and maybe I'm going to have to jump into that. Yes, that's right. No, I don't need to jump into that. So a couple of the things I, I want you to do, this is pretty much all, what you would find on the modules as well is I want you to think about the conversations that we've uh, you've been listening to, the ones I've been doing with various people from around the planet on global citizenship, and to take four points, make notes, four points that come out of those conversations. I also want you to think about the um, hopefully fun, intriguing, and delightful readings from the National Geographic History magazine. I'd like you to think about something that was quite surprising that you've learned from uh, any one of those readings. Okay, and I want you to bring that along as well to the seminar. Finally, I would like you to find a quote from any of the readings that you've done to date, that's from David Christian all the way through to now uh, with Burke, okay, and bring that with you as well. I'd also really appreciate it, save some time, if you go and you set up the app gosoapbox.com uh, on your smart device that you will have with you when you uh, attend the seminar. All of this, of course, can be done even if you know you're going to be working or doing something else in the seminar. But, you know, this is um, what I would uh, appreciate you doing uh, so that you are well prepared for, uh, you know, an interesting session, uh, engaging session on uh, what's where we're at so far in the course. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you can ignore the number until we... Um, get to the, uh, the seminar itself, this number would take you through Goat Soapbox to um, a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you to engage with and take your responses into breakout rooms and so on. I've got it all planned in my head. Um, 
but yeah, there won't be. I won't open any of those questions until uh, the time that we start our seminar. So that number will take you to a blank page. All right. So let's keep moving. So let's turn to Burke. Okay. Once upon a time, I say here. So Burke points out something I think that's really important to note that essentially, you know, the histories of the modern Middle East regard the environment as something that's in the background. Burke is a um, an environmental historian, and he sees this as a grave mistake, of course. Um, he sees that um, most of the way that we look at the environment and have done over the last 50 to 100 years particularly is that it can be managed with through technology, okay, and modern science, the science of agronomy and so on. But he sees this as modernist fables. Now I'm going to come back to that term at the very on the very last slide of this uh, snapshot. Uh, a modernist fable. Once upon a time, okay, people lived in ignorance and they didn't know what they were doing, and they kept on screwing up the environment. It took people like you know Turner and um, Townsend uh, to come along and turn farming into a science. And of course, it increased the productivity. We had to throw all those lazy peasants off the land, and so on. Uh, privatise the land. This is the kind of story that um, particularly dominated the 19th and 20th centuries, okay? Um, we are now starting, just starting to understand that, hey, massive monoculture isn't necessarily the best result, uh, best, it doesn't necessarily yield the best result. That's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. So where does he take us? Well, he takes us to power. Um, and as I was reading Burke, I started thinking about this curse of oil, which you can see here. Essentially, it's the curse of resource abundance. There is a direct correlation, and I'll give you a whole bunch of articles. These ones are accessible, sort of non-academic. Um, These two are um, academic articles on the curse of resource abundance and the correlation between resource abundance and authoritarian dictatorships and, and so on. But ex heavy exploitation of resources, Burke demonstrates very well in, in his chapter, degrade the environment. Ultimately, as the environment degrades, of course, resources become scarce and we get wobbly power structures. We get, you know, one um, dynasty taking over from another. We get uh, increased you know, internecine strife, that's war. Um, and so on, as these uh, power structures start to crumble. I think it's a very interesting thing, and I, uh, it, uh, I felt to put this slide in, in the middle of the Burke reading, um, because to me, we cannot underestimate the compelling power of resources it's what's driving our crazy behavior today. We, we, we're more worried about short-term resource acquisition um, than we are about long-term viability of a system. And I think that's really um, one of the grave challenges that, that we face. And as global citizens, uh, we, can, we can become more aware of the failings of you know, resources for resources state, uh, sake type thing. So let's keep moving. Back to Burke. So here we are. I love this image. I had to stick it in. Um, if we consider the deep history, now he's talking deep history. We've talked about deep time. Deep history is very variable. So if we consider the deep history of the region, now, which for him is roughly seven or eight thousand years in in its sort of um, in its depth, the ability of humans to alter the environment profoundly is hardly new. And the choices made by elites, and this is really important because the elites are the ones that are interested in the oil or the grain, the gold, the silver, the iron, and so on, that there are choices made by elites have always had consequences, often unforeseen, he says, that uh, further down the line. So in one generation, you know, it's fine to be uh, dragging this amount of wheat out of the uh, mud of Mesopotamia. Uh, two, three, four generations later, you're already starting to suffer from salination. So they moved to Bali. And then, of course, um, the agricultural world around them collapses entirely. Just to make my point, 
uh, there's some wheat growing in some rather dry mud. So Burke says, look, we can do a comparative history. And I think compar comparisons are very interesting. They really help us see things in a new light. He wants to look at the river valleys of the, of the area of the Middle East, that extended area. He's going to look at the Mediterranean dry farming, and he wants to look at deserts, oases, and wastelands, okay, which encourage pastoralism. He says, if we do this, we can uh, formulate a better understanding of the way that the environment changed and, and was shaped by human action over time. So he points out that river valleys uh, have been where most people have lived most of their lives. Okay, There's the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, Karun, there's the Amu Darya and the Himland, Hilmand, okay? which was central to the fate of ancient Middle Eastern empires. Okay, This is where we find the first cities for instance. He talks about the Silk Road and the role of pastoralists, that pastoralists weren't just losers out in the desert somewhere, they actually played a major role. We have to remember that the Mongols were, the, were you know, pastoralists in their day as well. Historically, he points out that pastoralists have also facilitated exchanges between societies, civilizations that were around them. The Silk Road, the reading for this week from the National Geo, that connected China and the West is also is, is but the most vivid example. Okay, the relationships between the agrarian world of the river valleys, and the merchants of the urban centres, and the pastoral nomads of the steppes, all constitute a leitmotif. That means a a recurring theme. Okay, in the history of this region that he's studying. Okay, so I've just put a reminder: make sure that you do go and have a quick read of the National Geo History article on the Silk Road. He also talks about family resemblances. This actually is not, you know, this is uh, from the Philippines. It's the Cordilleras in the Philippines. It should be an active link, but it doesn't seem to be jumping up and biting me at the moment. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, you can go and read out about the Cordilleras there. So he says, look, we can observe a family resemblance amongst the states and empires of this modern world, from China all the way across to the Mediterranean, all right? That means Morocco and places like that in North Africa. All were based on irrigation, intense cropping, and large flood control schemes, all sought to displace the negative consequences of their methods onto people outside of their society. That's something that we do. You know, in the, the developed first world countries of the West, we don't suffer so much from pollution. We don't suffer so much from the effects of climate change as people who are not responsible for those effects are in Bangladesh, Pacific Islands or wherever else. Um, I was thinking of Pakistan, the poor people who are suffering from the floods and, and so on at the moment. Sitting behind this is that last sentence there, which is in bold and underlined, the drive to make nature predictable and controllable goes back to the origins of civilization itself. And I want to add, if we think homo puppy from Bregman and, and, and so on, that the domestication of our own species has been part of making things predictable and controllable. If you're an authoritarian um, ruler, you want to make sure that your people are not going to rise up and overthrow you. So predictability and controllability come into the very essence of our civilised world. We can see it in Australia today, the way in which the states responded to the COVID crisis and the way with which we all complied so readily with mask wearing and so on. There was a scientific rationality to that. Oh, yes, we need to do that so that we don't spread COVID. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to infect my parents or whatever it might be. But there was also already we have all the structures in our world to control the Australian population. And that could be said for populations around the world anywhere, particularly populations in explicitly authoritarian governments. So last slide, uh, I'm just going to, I keep moving myself around. I don't know whether it moves around on your screen, but I have to move it around so I can see what I'm talking about. So here we are. Go back to week one, energy equals resources. I think David Christian. There are a number of points I'd like you to take away from this week's reading and hopefully bring into the seminar. Human actions have effects. Lessons from Bert the third. Human imagination generates stories and about both action and effects. 
the stories might take the form of Hammurabi's code of laws or myth mythologies like the Gilgamesh story. Modernist fables, we have our own stories. This is something that David Christian points out, as, as does um, Yuval Harari and others, uh, that modernist fables about progress and development. This is an imagined order to draw on Harari. As we work to control that nature, maximizing energy, we generate complexity. Hmm. I'm bringing David Christian now. And complex systems are highly energy dependent. We have the most complex global system at the moment. It is highly energy dependent. What happens when we run out of oil? What happens when uh, the um, when climate change starts putting real pressure on energy systems? Well, we don't know yet but we uh, need to be getting ourselves ready. So what do we say? The last point for this week's um, snapshot is link those lessons or these lessons in the readings from week one to six. We can see that a global citizen needs to be mindful of local variations, the kind of thing that um, the comparative work that Burke is doing, but be aware that we are part of larger systems and that all of them weave together. The systems are interlinked, okay? We can't extract the hydrosphere from the atmosphere, from the biosphere, and so on. We can look at them separately to help us understand certain processes, but we need to come back to understanding how they sit within the whole. All right, so thank you very much. I will hit beep, then stop share, and I will see you hopefully in the seminars. If not, the seminars will be recorded. Take care and see you soon. Thank you.